Hi, I'm Scott Wolf, and this is part two of a video I worked on with Disney legend Bob Gurr. I'm going to share more fascinating stories about Bob's work during the earliest days at Disneyland. The early days of Disneyland brought many mishaps and challenges, and Bob was often called upon to remedy the situation. Besides designing Disney's most popular vehicles, such as those for the Haunted Mansion, Pirates of the Caribbean, the Matterhorn, and Space Mountain, Bob also had to deal with things like the man-made flowers that were falling apart in Alice in Wonderland, and the real-life plants that were freezing over in the Jungle Cruise. When Disneyland first opened, a lot of the attractions were kind of temporary. They needed a lot of work to bring them to the quality that Disney has become known for. The natives of the Jungle Cruise are a great example of that. Walt's movie special effects wizard Bob Maddy worked at the Disney Studio and could build anything for a movie real quick. In fact, he later went on to work for Steven Spielberg and he built the Great White Shark for the movie Jaws. He created the mechanisms for the first dancing natives in the Jungle Cruise. And here's what Bob told me about those figures. The guy was uh, a kind of a guy, the jack of all trades, kind of a uh, blacksmith type guy. He could build anything to do anything for a movie real quick. Now, it doesn't have to be durable because anything you build on a movie lot um, is expendable. It's only got to stay together long enough for the shoot and then they, then they throw it in the back, throw it in the yeah. boneyard. But, um, He'd come up with um, a gorgeous dancing uh, native that danced up and down, mm -hmm. and all, you know, could rise up and down. Beautiful motion on it, and Walt liked it. So then uh, Roger Brogy, my boss, got me and, and took me over to uh, the shop. And this thing was a crude machine in which when it ran, a guy had to stand there with a, a can of oil squirting all the rubbing parts. Uh, you know, because it was it was, a, it was a crude quickie, but it but it was um, it was perfect. So anyway, Roger looked at me and he said, "Walt likes it. You make it work." <laughs> <laughs> oh, I took the measurements and looked at everything, and the guy that invented it, he was perfectly happy because that he doesn't want to do uh, permanent machinery. So I designed. Um, a mechanism that was a aluminum uh, gear case with gears and cams and all the stuff in safely inside the box because it's going to run in a, in a wet jungle and uh, then all of the parts uh, for the mechanism for the turntable and the way the uh, the um, as the guys dance they, they rotate remember how they rotated around sure yeah like six dancers on a uh, on, rotating on a rotating turn turntable. Um, it was a bunch of automotive rod ends, you know, steering parts and cars. In other words, I was a car guy. If you're going to have a, a jungle environment that's out there in the wet, uh, sure, use car parts there because they got seals and everything on it. You know, hmm. don't use fancy stuff, use auto stuff. Huh. That thing ran, I think it ran oh, 30 years before they did the first overhaul. There's a giant leap between a, a demo and something that's going to run for 20 years at Disneyland, 16 yeah. hours a day. That's fascinating. Yeah, so that was one of my that was one of my, my one of my favorites because it was very right. believable looking. You know, there was another problem in the Jungle Rides early days, and it had to do with the authentic jungle foliage that Bill Evans had planted throughout. Disney had their own version of smudge pots, hundreds of clean lanterns that they'd have to place around the Jungle Cruise route each night after the guests were gone, and that was quite a chore. Here's a photo I took of Disney legend Bill Evans, who was in charge of Disneyland's landscaping. Bill asked Bob if he could make a barge that would carry their lanterns around the waterway so they could just ride on the boat and stop and set them in the bushes to keep the plants warm at night, and that's what Bob did. The Adventureland Frost Barge was a watercraft that Bob designed for Disneyland, so as you can see, not everything he worked on was seen by the park's guests. The Imagineers were always learning and improving along the way. By 1958, when the Alice in Wonderland attraction opened, they knew much more about how to create better quality and safer mechanics, and how to sustain them for the long run. So Bob did all the mechanics for Alice in Wonderland, rather than having an outside company do it as they had done before. One technology he improved at Walt's request was the doors that would open as the vehicles approached it. 
Until then, the doors worked like the older, lower quality dark rides of the time, where the vehicle approached a door and literally bumped into the door to open it. Walt wanted it where the door would open just before the vehicle bumped into it so it's never hit. And Bob created a method which worked to achieve that, and they ended up using that technology in many of the other rides as well. Having Bob working on the technology rather than an outside company brought it to a new level. But they were all still learning, and sometimes Bob found himself having to improve on his own work. As you go in uh, and you make the first right turn, you start up a slight slope, you have the, the flower room. You know what the music da 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 da. Sure. Still Golden learning. afternoon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, the flowers, and they're about six feet tall and eight feet tall, and they, they do this. So I had rigged it up with aluminum uh, rods, you know, for the flower stems, mm -hmm. with, a, uh, with an elastomeric mount and a, a little rack where rod irons tied together to a motor, a little motor crank, so they're all in tune to the music. And after a few months, the, um, the, the flowers started to fall down, the aluminum broke. Oh, and I didn't know about aluminum alloys. I didn't know stress analysis. I didn't know any of that stuff. So I took one look at what happened. I could see in an instant. I bought a book called um, Corrosion Fatigue in Naval Aircraft. And I started reading about why aluminum fails. And it was like, oh, my God, I had no idea. Yeah. So I said, what will bend forever and not break? What do you think? What would bend forever and not break? Not aluminum, steel? Oh, a fishing rod. A fishing rod? Fishing oh. Rod. You know, you can go yeah. out and catch a marlin from the back. Sure. Got a hold of this thing, and it bends like mad, you know, on the little leaders, the little eyelets, and the yeah. line goes out, and you're pulling 150 pounds. Oh, my. Pounds. They never break. They don't. Oh. They're Is that what you did? Huh. Wow. Well, I went down the street uh, with the Siloflex Fishing Rod Company and said, uh, I want to buy a bunch of fishing rods, um, yeah. partially built. I don't need any of the, uh, the handle and I don't need any eyelets. Can you sell me a whole bunch? Uh, he said, yeah, we've got a bunch of those. What are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm not going to catch any fish, but <laughs> I'm going to make flower stems out of them. <laughs> I love that. But, but that's how you learn. Yeah. Um, very quick. It was a very quick thing to um, solve that. You know, I just <laughs> put the side of like fishing rods in there and everybody was happy. Oh my gosh. Uh, live and learn. My goodness. Well, that, well that's, that's what Walt was. Everybody was a live and learn. Hmm. Bob shared a few more stories from those lesser known projects he worked on that really demonstrate the challenges those early Imagineers were presented with. It's fascinating. In the early days of the Jungle Cruise, art director Vic Green wanted two rhinos to charge the boat, turn around, and go back and wait for the next boat before charging again. Now, as always, it was very important with the mechanical figures that they don't look mechanical, that they don't keep doing the same repetitive motion. Bob worked out a machine that seemed to do that pretty well, and each time it was just a little different. I'll let Bob tell the rest of this story. The rhinos would go out and do to some spring spring like arrangements that I had the the uh, with the control cam on the bottom when the machine reversed uh, the design the the two rhinos would be caused to come back slightly different that way they would turn around and, and go back and the same thing it would reverse again and turn around and wait for the next boat then they charge the boat back and forth and after some months went by, we got reports where public was complaining. Uh, they don't like the idea of the rhinos mooning the guests. <laughs> really? They would come out and moon the guests. They would come, because they come backwards. <laughs> so it, was, it turned out to be a rather embarrassing machine, which we never did solve. No matter what we did, that thing would not respond. No kidding. Because it was too soon. This was before we had con controls for, for uh, devices like that. <laughs> Another mechanical mishap was for the mine train attraction. This one was for a deer that would appear to be bounding on a hillside. The bounding deer was um, the one machine that looked absolutely terrific when you saw it running. Yeah. But it was a machine that had a technical fault that no one could ever solve. What it was, it was a uh, three-cornered track 
uh, kind of tilted up on a hillside and uh, the deer would be running along with a little carriage. So all you saw was the bounding, uh, the bounding deer. It looked really good, but it had a cable drive where it was connected to a steel cable that would go around uh, three pulleys driven by a, a motor. That meant the cable it has to be spliced together. Now, cable splicing is a common thing for ski lifts, things like that. The companies that are in that business uh, were hired to splice the cables. Now, for some reason, we never could figure out the cable splices would only last about a month and it would start to come apart. Huh. And all of the guys that were the smartest guys using a thing called a Marlin pin, which is a sharp little dagger-like device, they're, they're putting his cable back together and then it, and until it's perfect. And then it slowly unravels itself. So I think there was something to do with the way I had arranged the pulleys. So the cable did a slight rotation as it went around each of the three pulleys, which meant over a month's time, the cable would have kind of rolled itself like a donut rolling on and on and on. And that apparently did something that allowed the splice to unwind. So we get we gave up. Nobody could ever figure out how to do it. The, uh, the people that knew how to do this had never seen such a thing. Um, <laughs> so one day they just said, oh, turn it off. So the last I knew, until they, we tore up in that area, the, the concrete trough and the pulleys were still up there on the hill. The mountain sheep was also for the mine train attraction. Unlike the bounding deer, this one worked flawlessly. The sheep kind of hid in the rocks and then it would jump out as guests went by. It looked good and it worked perfectly during testing when the ride was closed. Except it was a little too good. It was a simple machine, uh, worked it out really, really nice, very straightforward, nice design. But the idea was as the, the little mule train would come along with the, uh, you know, the mule rider in the front mule, uh, the guy in the back and then the mules in the middle with all the little kids strapped on them. They, they're just doing their little jog along. You know, it's a mule trail, there's animals. Mm -hmm. And they wanted this, uh, this sheep to, you know, or pop up and you know, look like a real sheep coming out of the rocks like they do. Well, the first day we ran it, oh. uh, the first mule, mules are unpredictable. They have, a, they have their own philosophy of life where they will do things and not do things. Uh, the, the sheep jumped up and the, uh, the first, uh, first mule reared up, oh, no. fell over and, and started going down the, uh, down the cliff into the water. And Gosh. since all, all the animals are tied together and everybody's strapped on, all of the animals and all of the guests wound up in the river. <gasps> You're kidding. Oh, no. my God. <laughs> Wow. It, was, it was a first class emergency. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, a lot of bruising and scratches, but nobody drowned, you know. Well, that's good. <laughs> so, operation said, turn it off, turn it yeah. off. Yeah. And they waited, I think, about a week and because the art directors wanted it back because it was very, very nice looking machine. So, they loaded everybody up again and, uh, just as the uh, lead mule came within a foot or two of where the trigger was, he stopped and would not go any further. <laughs> uh, that mule never forgot and did not want to oh. see that sheep ever again. Oh, so the machine uh, never ran again. It ran one time after test. So that was my best machine ever. <laughs> oh, it scared, it scared the daylights. <laughs> Out of a mule caused a mule train wreck and <laughs> oh my god one time <laughs> oh that was oh. a good one you know so much work went into those early days of disneyland doing things that had never been done before they couldn't look to other parks to see how they did it because everything walt wanted was innovative and they constantly had to improve and they had to improve quality and they had to improve safety but you know walt disney had an uncanny knack at choosing the people who could get the job done not based on their resume or degree, but based on getting to know the people. 
I want to play an audio clip for you from a conversation I had with Bob about 15 years ago where he explained his take on it. After designing $43 million worth of uh, specialized equipment for the industry, yeah. I have no license. I was never <laughs> trained as an engineer. Wow. I had a degree in industrial design from Art Center College, which nobody ever asked for. Oh, really? So going to Art Center College to learn uh, automobile styling, mm -hmm. which doesn't require engineering, yeah. no job I ever had did, were they ever interested that I had a degree in anything. Huh. But again, that's the way Walt worked. He was yeah. collecting people based upon what he thought a person might be able to I do. Hear that. A... I don't take it for granted when I have the opportunity to speak with someone like Bob about what it was like as a pioneer in the creation of Disneyland. And I'm beyond grateful he took the time to work with me on this video.